We're live. All right. We're live. We're live. We're on the air, you guys. I guess we'll just wait. We're all on. We're on, man. Your your voice is going all over the world right now. Millions of people are listening. Billions. <laughs> all right. All right. So open your Bibles up to First Kings chapter seven. We're going to get started. Um, I'm going to pray to get us going here first. So, Father, we want to thank you once again, Lord, for our time that we have here together to open your word together and just to continue to uh, explore Solomon and his great works and the things that he accomplished. And, uh, Lord, we do want to ask tonight that uh, by your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would speak to us, that we could find these nuggets of wisdom and uh, things that we can grow by as we read these scriptures together. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for this abundance of information that we have here in these uh, chapters. And uh, Father, I do want to let you know that we are so blessed to be together here with you tonight. We just want to dedicate this time to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So um, last week we took a look at some of the cool stuff that happened when, when uh, Solomon was building the temple. And uh, we left off uh, noting that the construction of the original temple uh, took seven years. Doesn't seem like a very long time, especially the when you see that the seven, especially when you see that the uh, temple construction at the time of Jesus was going on for some forty years to build that one. And I have a a sense that it was not nearly as magnificent as the one that uh, that Solomon built. But we also remember that from, from what we saw last week that he had upwards of 150,000 people working on this project. And, um, you know, hewing the trees and shipping them, floating them all down to, you know, to the building sites and the the woodcutters and the amazing, amazing. So as we begin in chapter seven, and I do want you to know that as we go through some of these uh, next couple of chapters, it is just a lot of general information. But at the same time, I would note that every item that was in the temple had very significant meaning to it. Every single item in the temple pointed to Jesus. That's why they say that Jesus is found on every page of the Bible. The whole temple was a picture of his redemption for, for mankind. And, and so we want to keep that in mind. And if you are uh, a very astute person and you want, I would encourage you to, to uh, dig deeper into some of these furnishings and things like that that they had. Um, I'm not going to be doing that as we go through here. Um, we're going to just kind of take it as a, a survey as we go through it, just to see um, some of the things that were, that were built for this. Um, but uh, it's a very interesting study, if that's something you ever have a desire to do on your own. So chapter 7 starts out with uh, Solomon uh, building his own complex. And the building of his complex took 13 years. Not that he rushed to get the temple done, or not that he cared more about his own home, because this was not just a home. This was a complex. This was a place that had many different types of palaces and buildings that were all part of Solomon's place, uh, not just where he lived, but so much more. There was so much more to it. And then we'll see that as we go through. So let's start in verse 1 of chapter 7. 
So it says that Solomon completed his entire palace complex after 13 years of construction. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. So this is one construction. This is one facility uh, that he built. Now, the forest of Lebanon property, if you will, was kind of a, a fortress. It was a place perhaps where uh, soldiers uh, would stay or something along those lines. They called it the house of the forest of Lebanon because the lumber that was used to build it was um, cedar mainly that came from Lebanon. So that's where it got its name. He says that it was 150 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high on the four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams on top of the pillars. And it was paneled above with cedar at the top of the chambers that rested on 45 pillars. This is quite the, uh, quite the construction here. 15 per row. There were three rows of window frames facing each other in three tiers. All the doors and the doorposts had rectangular frames, the openings facing each other in three tiers. He made the hall of the pillars uh, 75 feet long and 45 feet wide. A portico was in front of the pillars and a canopy with pillars was in front of them. And he made the hall of the throne where he would judge. So here's a whole other building. The hall of judgment. It was paneled with cedar from the floor to the rafters. Solomon's own palace where he would live in the outer courtyard behind the hall was of similar construction. And he made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter who was his wife. Remember we read that he had made a treaty with Pharaoh in Egypt and to solidify that treaty he married Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter, his wife, gets her own house. No small house, not just a little one-bedroom chateau. This was a big, huge place for her also uh, to dwell in. So, uh, verse 9 tells us that all of these buildings were of costly stones, cut to size, and sawed with saws on the inner and outer surfaces. From foundation to coping, and from the outside to the great courtyard. The foundation was made of large costly stones, 12 and 15 feet long. Above were also costly stones cut to size, as well as cedar wood. Around the great courtyard, as well as the inner courtyard of the Lord's temple, and the portico of the temple, were three rows of dressed stone, and a row of trimmed cedar beams. King Solomon had Hiram uh, brought from Tyre. He was a widow's son from the tribe of Naphtali. His father was a man of Tyre, a bronze craftsman. Hiram had great skill and understanding and knowledge to do every kind of bronze work. So he came to King Solomon and carried out all of his work. So Hiram and Solomon worked together to build the original temple, and now they are also working together as they're building the, um, the complex uh, for Solomon himself. The bronze pillars, it tells us that he cast two bronze pillars. Each of them were 27 feet high. 18 feet in circumference. These were huge. He also made two capitals of cast bronze to set on top of the pillars. Seven and a half feet was the height of the first capital. Seven and a half feet was also the height of the second capital. The capitals on the top of the pillars had gratings of latticework, wreaths made of chain work. Seven for the first capital and seven for the second. 
Now, I cannot envision in my mind what this looked like. I'm wondering how your mind is able to try to focus. Uh, it would be great if we had some kind of picture we could flash up, but uh, pretty amazing. Just reading the description of this is, is quite uh, intriguing. Verse 18, he made these pillars with two encircling rows of pomegranates. One on the, on the one grating to cover the capital on top. He did the same for the second capital. And the capitals on the top of the pillars in the portico were shaped like lilies, six feet high. The capitals on the two pillars were also immediately above the rounded surface next to the grating. And 200 pomegranates were in rows encircling each capital. He set up the pillars at the portico of the sanctuary. He set up the right pillar and named it Jachin. And he set up the left pillar and named it Boaz. The tops of the pillars were shaped like lilies. And then the work of the pillars were completed. Verse 23, he made the cast metal basin 15 feet from brim to brim perfectly round it was seven and a half feet high and 45 feet in circumference ornamental golds in gourds encircled it below the brim 10 every half yard completely encircling the basin the gourds were cast in two rows when the basin was cast. It stood on 12 oxen, three facing the north, three facing the west, three facing the south, three facing the east. So what we're looking at here from verse 15 up to where we're at right now, um, we're looking at some of the things that were constructed for the temple itself. This metal basin was a pretty amazing thing, um, made of bronze, and it was for ceremonial washings and so forth like that. Very ornate um, and a beautiful thing. You know, you, you can kind of imagine in your mind that it had these 12 oxen, you know, uh, holding up this giant, it was like a giant bowl basically, and uh, it was a perfect circle. Now, you know, there's been some critics that have come along and said, oh, you know, uh, it's not very, very uh, accurate here because, I don't know, maybe you remember, I can't quite remember what pi is, 3.14. So in order to make a perfect circle and the diameter and all that kind of stuff, they did have the technology and the knowledge, mathematical knowledge, to use that formula uh, to make this perfectly round basin. Um, the basin was on top of these oxen with their hindquarters towards the center, so their heads were all facing out. The basin itself is three inches thick. That's pretty thick. And its rim was fashioned like the brim of a cup or of a lily blossom. It held 11,000 gallons of water. And then he made 10 bronze water carts. Each water cart was six feet long, six feet wide, and four and a half feet high. This was the design of the carts. They had frames. The frames were between, between the cross pieces, and on the frames between the cross pieces were lions, oxen, and cherubim. On the cross pieces there was a pedestal above, and below the lions and oxen were wreaths of hanging work. Each cart had four bronze wheels with bronze axles. Underneath the four corners of the basin were cast supports, 
each next to a wreath. And the water carts opening inside the crown on the top was 18 inches wide. The opening was round, made as a uh, pedestal 27 inches wide. On it were carvings, but their frames were square, not round. Interesting. There were four wheels under the frames, and the wheel axles were part of the water cart. Each wheel was 27 inches tall. The wheel's design was similar to that of a chariot wheel. Their axle, rims, spokes, and hubs were all of cast metal. Four supports were at the four corners of each water cart. Each support <laughs> was one piece with the water cart. At the top of the cart was a band nine inches high encircling it. Also at the top of the cart, its braces and its frames were one piece with it. He engraved cherubim, lions, and palm trees on the plates of its braces and on its frames. Wherever each had a space with encircling wreaths. In this way, he made the ten water carts using the same casting dimensions and shape for them all. So, like I told you before we started reading this, this is really, really deep, if you will, when it comes to the design and the work that was put in uh, to these furnishings. These different types of things were being created. And, of course, we read earlier here that it was... Uh, uh, It was all done by this man from, from Tyre, Tyre, who was a bronze worker. He had his work cut out for him, didn't he? Um, Hiram. And uh, what a contract to be able to get contracted out to do all this work for, uh, for the Lord. You know, interesting, to we really don't know much about Hiram except that... Uh, he had a treaty with, with uh, uh, Solomon, and he did supply Solomon with a lot of the material that they used to build uh, his home, his palaces, and, of course, the temple, and the furnishings that were all associated with it. And uh, so a very, very talented man. Um, we don't really see a whole lot in here that would lend us to know or not know whether he was converted um, to the Jewish faith. We do know that in one of the original passages we read a week or two ago, um, that he did acknowledge that Solomon's God was God. Um, but... He was from uh, Naphtali, or from the tribe of Naphtali. And uh, so we're not too sure. We don't know a whole lot about this fellow, except that uh, he was a great, great craftsman. Probably uh, one of a kind, if you will. So as we go on here, we see that in verse 38... He also made ten bronze basins. And each basin held 220 gallons. And each was six feet wide. One basin for each of the ten water carts. He set five water carts on the right side of the temple and five on the left side. He put the basin near the right side of the temple, towards the southeast. And then Hiram made the basins and the shovels and the sprinkling basins. <laughs> Amazing. So Hiram had finished all the work that he was doing for King Solomon on the Lord's temple. Two pillars, bowls for the capitals that were on the top of the two pillars. 
the two gratings for covering both bowls of the capitals that were on top of the pillars, the 400 pomegranates for the two gratings, two rows of pomegranates for each grating, covering both capital bowls on the top of the pillars, the 10 water carts, the 10 basins on the water carts, the basin, the 12 oxen underneath the basin, and the pots, shovels, and sprinkling basins. All the utensils that Hiram made for King Solomon at the Lord's temple were made of burnished bronze. The king had them cast in clay molds in the Jordan Valley between Sukkoth and Zarethan. Solomon left all the utensils unweighed because there were so many. The weight of the bronze was not determined. So a lot of bronze, burnished bronze, right? And uh, very symbolic of the types of metal that they used for um, all of these things that, that they're creating here. It also says that Solomon also made all the equipment in the Lord's temple. The gold altar, the gold table that the bread of the presence was placed on, the pure gold lampstand in front of the inner sanctuary, five on the right, five on the left, the gold flowers, lamps, tongs, the pure gold ceremonial bowls, wick trimmers, sprinkling basins, ladles, and fire pans, and the gold hinges for the doors of the inner temple, that is the most holy place, and for the doors of the temple sanctuary. So all the work King Solomon did in the Lord's temple was completed. And then Solomon brought in the consecrated things of his father David. The silver, the gold, the utensils, and put them in the treasury of the Lord's temple. Wow, that's a lot of stuff going on there. So bronze, of course, I believe, if I'm right here, bronze speaks of judgment. Um, gold speaks of purity. Um, so each type, metal type, had a specific meaning behind it, and it was used to make specific pieces of furniture, depending on where they were located within the temple. So when you get into the holy place, we don't find any bronze. It's all gold especially when you get into the Holy of Holies, the table, the lampstand, everything was made out of pure gold. It's no wonder why when Solomon's temple was sacked, they were so excited about it because there was a lot of gold there. Now, I know I blew through chapter 7, and I, and I did that because... We could spend weeks looking at this chapter, okay? Um, but I kind of wanted to try to get started at least tonight, and I wasn't really, you know, positive if we were going to get this far, but I do, I do want to kind of open up chapter 8 a little bit because they're still talking about a lot of the... Uh, A lot of the things that are going to be going on at the temple, this is an account of the actual dedication of the temple site. And they'll be bringing in the um, Ark of the Covenant to put it, in it, put it in its place. Interesting, though, one of the things we'll find as we go through this particular chapter is that you might remember in the Ark of the Covenant, when Moses constructed it, the items that were placed inside of it. There was 
a bowl of manna that the children of Israel lived on for 40 years. Could you imagine? <clears throat> Get kind of tired of eating manna, maybe after a while, right? Nobody really knows what manna is. Evidently, though, the ark had a way of preserving it because it was put into a bowl and it was stuck in, put inside the ark as a memorial uh, for God's provision. Where God guides, God provides. Seek me in the wilderness and I will provide for your food. I'll keep you. It must have had some great vitamins and nutrition. And I think that it tells us actually that it kind of had a sweet taste to it. Um, and another interesting thing about the manna was that it was only good for a day. Otherwise it would spoil. Or melt. Or get corrupted to where you couldn't eat it. So <clears throat> they had to make manna in all different forms, I'm sure. I mean, maybe they had banana pancakes. <laughs> or banana bread. Or I mean, you know, you got 40 years, right? You're got to get a little inventive here to, to keep it up. And you also remember that story where uh, they got really tired of it. They're like, we want some meat, man, you know. So God sent them some meat. And he sent them so much meat, they got sick from it. And it was almost like, you know, why can't we just be content with what God provides? And why do we have to be looking elsewhere for other things when he's taking really good care of us? He's taking really good care of this massive group of people, providing them water, providing them all these great things. So manna, oh, and another thing about manna, um, interestingly, um, because on the Sabbath, you remember, they weren't allowed to go out and harvest anything. They weren't allowed to labor in any way. So they had to go out on Friday and get enough manna to last them till Sunday through the Sabbath. Which was an amazing thing because during the week when they were going out every day to collect their daily ration of it, it wouldn't last more than one day. But then when they would go out on Friday to collect twice as much, then God would preserve it for the following day so that it wouldn't spoil. I just think that's kind of interesting. You know, how God made a provision. I want you to keep the Sabbath day holy. I don't want you to be working. I want you to focus on me and all the great things I've done. So I'm still going to provide for your needs. Um, and I'm going to preserve this little manna stuff to uh, get you through Saturday, too. So just an amazing little thing. So the manna was in the ark. What else was in the ark? Hmm? The stone, the Ten Commandments were in there. And there was one other thing. Aaron's staff. So you remember the story of Aaron's staff. It was a, uh, a stick, basically, uh, that budded and came to life. It was a, I just got them burn a bunch of sticks, you know, from those windstorms we had a while back, and uh, throw them on the fire and burn them. They're dead. They're, they make great campfire wood and stuff like that, but to have one actually bud and come to life, um, pretty miraculous. So that was placed in the ark also. So you had those three items. Interestingly enough, though, at this time now, as the ark is getting prepared to be put in its place, there's only one item in there, and that's the tablets, the Ten Commandments. The other two are not there. Not sure why. Perhaps because they were placed in there for a certain time of memorial to remind the children of Israel about God's providing for them in the wilderness. 
But we're going to find out as we read through uh, chapter 8 that uh, there was only the Ten Commandments in there at this time. Also, another interesting thing um, is ever since the temple was destroyed, one of the most coveted items from all the other people groups that, that raided from the Babylonians and Nebuchadnezzar and all these other people, they wanted the Ark. They wanted that Ark of the Covenant. But they never got it. And even to this day, people are looking for it. I saw a little documentary on that not too long ago. And it's amazing the effort that treasure hunters, if you will, have put into trying to find this piece of furniture. Because it's not just a regular piece of furniture. It, it generates power. It, it's unique in its construction. And here's something that's interesting. Nobody's ever found it. Where is it? Oh, well, the Templars, they took it and they stashed it somewhere in the catacombs underneath Israel. And, you know, they're, they've got all of these ideas about where it might have been hidden. Of course, they still haven't found it. Now, I think the reason that they haven't found it is because it's not on the earth. It's in heaven. I think that's where it's at. Because in the book of Revelation, it talks about how, and we'll look at this in a little bit more depth later, but it talks about the Ark of the Covenant being in the throne room of God. So it was taken by angels, much like uh, Elijah didn't taste death. He was raptured, if you will. And uh, so I don't believe that that piece of furniture is on the planet. It's in heaven. And uh, so that's kind of an interesting little thought, too. So a lot of cool stuff when it comes to that. So let's at least knock on the doors of chapter 8 here a little bit. It says, at that time, Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, all the tribal heads and the ancestral leaders of the Israelites before him at Jerusalem in order to bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from the city of David, that is Zion. So all the men of Israel were assembled in the presence of King Solomon in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month, at the festival. So this is August, September, somewhere in that area. The elders of Israel came and the priests picked up the ark. The priests and the Levites brought the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and the holy utensils that were in the tent. So you remember when they were in the wilderness that the, there was no temple. The ark lived in a tent. And whenever they moved, they would pack the tent up and pack the ark up and move to their next spot. And they'd put it all back together again and, you know, put the ark in its place. And, and uh, so they're bringing all of this now over to its new site. So King Solomon in verse 5, and the entire congregation of Israel who had gathered around him were with him in front of the ark. It must have been an awesome moment. They were sacrificing sheep and goats and cattle that could not be counted or numbered because there were so many. Now, what is up with that? I've always wondered. Why wouldn't one cow be enough? Or a sheep? You know, or a goat? 
Why did they have to do so many that it can't be numbered? You know, this practice continues all the way up to the time of Jesus. When Passover came and everybody had to bring their little animal to sacrifice, whether it was a lamb or a a dove or whatever it might have been, that was one bloody mess. Thousands and thousands of animals being bled out on the temple grounds there. The smell, the and then they're they're well, I mean, think about this, the, the the hugeness of this. And we see that happening here. Why? Why couldn't it have just been a solemn one little lamb? Because there is only one lamb of God. You would think that might make sense. Why so much blood? And I and I gotta think maybe the reason behind that is that sin is a really messy thing. Sin is really an ugly thing. It's stinky. And these priests that were doing these sacrifices, they must have been literally covered in it. I don't know. Some people, when they see blood, they pass out. You know, you go to get blood drawn at the doctor, and it's like, hmm. <coughs> These folk got used to it really, really quick, I would imagine. Now, there are other uh, cultures where they would bleed these animals out, and then part of the ritual would be to drink the blood from these animals. And that was not so with the, the Jews. But the blood was shed. The blood poured out of these. Maybe it was to show us a picture of, of the great cost that it would take in the future to cleanse us from our sins. The blood of one lamb. The blood of Christ. Um, The New Testament calls it the precious blood of Jesus. We're not redeemed by gold or silver or the blood of oxen or goats, but by the precious blood of Jesus. So, kind of a significant thing there. Um, And again, God wants these people to understand that sin has a huge cost to it. Even the very, very first time in the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve blew it, What, was, what happened as they were hiding in the bushes with their fig leaves on? You ever wore a fig leaf? You ever seen a fig leaf? They are nasty. They're covered in all these little teeny tiny like, well, they're not thorns, but they're really stiff, hairy things. That would be the worst thing in the world to make an outfit from, don't you think? But yet they were trying to cover their sin and so they were kind of desperate to do it and so they sew fig leaves together and then they sit around like this wondering what the heck's going on, right? Until God came along and said, what kind of outfit you guys wearing there? Fig leaves, Dad. Oh, they look great. Maybe I can do one better for you than fig leaves. You're trying really hard by your own means to cover up your sin, and all it does is wind up irritating you more. It, it, it becomes worse when you try to cover your sin. So I'm going to take an animal, and I'm going to murder it, slay it, sacrifice its innocent blood to make an outfit for you guys. And quite sure that it was a lamb that he made these nice little outfits for Adam and Eve to cover themselves with. 
So we find that this whole blood shedding thing, it starts in the very beginning, in Genesis. The whole shedding of blood to cover sin started right there in the garden with that very first sacrifice. That's why when... Um, When it came time for their boys to bring a sacrifice, the one understood the shedding of blood. The other did not. The one understood the shedding of innocent blood in order to cover themselves. The other brother, he didn't quite get that. He was still trying to do it by the work of his own hands, by bringing an offering of his greatest garden works that he had done. And so we know one was uh, accepted, the other was rejected. And there again, you start seeing this picture of you can't cover your own sin. You can't deal with your own sin. It's the shedding of innocent blood that covers. Now, Jesus' blood does not just cover our sin. It washes it away. It makes it go away. I mean, you know, even God said, though your sins are as crimson, they'll become as white as snow. You're going to be purified by the blood of the Lamb of God, the Son. And so here I say all of that just to kind of give us a little bit of a, a flavor, if you will, um, for the greatness, the great loss of life that had to take place um, in order for these people to just have a covering for their sin. So the elders came, they bring the ark, they're sacrificing sheep, cattle, goats, thousands and thousands of them. And the priests in verse 6 bring the ark of the Lord, the Lord's covenant, uh, into its place, which would have been the Holy of Holies. It tells us it was the most holy place beneath the wings of the cherubim. Now, do you remember last time when we were here, we were talking about these two cherubim that were made inside the Holy of Holies? Not the, not the smaller version that was on top of the ark, but we're talking about these big, humongous cherubim that their wings were so huge that they touched each side of the wall of the Holy of Holies, and then their inner wings touched one another. These were like eight feet long wings. They were huge cherubim that they were made. And I don't believe they were chubby little children, which is, you see that a lot these days, you know. The little cherubim with, you know, chubby little cheeks. No, I think they were much more than that. I think they're very, very powerful, powerful angels who do God's bidding. And so they came to the inner sanctuary of the temple, to the most holy place below or beneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim were spreading their wings over the place of the ark, so that the cherubim covered the ark and its poles from above. The poles were so long that their ends were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they were not seen from outside the sanctuary. And they're still there today. And then here he touches on what we had mentioned earlier. Nothing was in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of the land of Egypt. So we get another vision here 
picture, if you will, of the inside of the Holy of Holies. What an awesome, beautiful place. And I'm sure you know, perhaps, that you couldn't just casually meander into the Holy of Holies. You'd be fried. You'd explode. You'd, whatever would happen, you'd, you'd be done in. And so this is a very holy place where one guy gets to go in there once a year to do sacrifice for the people's sins. That's pretty intense. That that place would sit there like that all year long with nobody going in. Except for that one time when the high priest would go and he would offer sacrifices for the sins of the nation to cover all the people. And again, a beautiful, beautiful illustration here of what Jesus did for us. He was the only one worthy to literally go into the Holy of Holies and present himself before the Father, not only as the high priest, but also as the sacrifice too. Jesus embodied all these different aspects of the covering of sin. He was the Lamb of God. He was the sacrifice for sin. He was the creator of the universe. He was the only begotten son. He was many, many things. And if you read Hebrews, Hebrews tells us about how Jesus is our high priest. And because of what he did on our behalf, now we, because we're washed in the blood, if you will, we can enter in now to that holy place with the Father. Not literally can we go in that room that they had, but in the spiritual sense of fulfilling what that room represented, we're allowed to enter in. That's what we try to do when we come and pray. We bring our requests to the Lord and we come in to that holy place before God. It just happened to be this little circle earlier tonight as we all gathered to pray and, and intercede. So the priest who went in there once a year, oh, from what I understand, they would tie a little rope around his ankle. Just in case. With little bells on the bottom of his robe, right? So as he's in there, they're out there listening. They can hear the little bells ringing. And boy, you better hope that you did all your washings and all your cleansings and all the traditional things that you needed to do as the high priest before you went in. You needed to deal with your own stuff, right? And... uh I don't know if it ever happened or not, but I guess the bells were there because if they quit ringing, <laughs> it was time to start tugging on the rope, right? Pull him out. He's gone. He's a goner. He didn't make it. Yeah, kind of strange stuff. Interesting stuff. So when the priests came out of the holy place, the cloud filled the Lord's temple. This is amazing. A cloud. And because of the cloud, the priests were not able to continue ministering for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. A cloud. Now, I mean, I guess if I was writing it, I would want to put a very bright light or a fire. Or something along those lines, you know. But a cloud. He dwells within the cloud. As a matter of fact, if you look at verse 12, and we're going to start to park right here because I don't want to get too far into this prayer here. But Solomon said, 
the Lord said that he would dwell in total darkness. Isn't that interesting? Do you ever think about him dwelling in total darkness? Or is it that we always think of him dwelling in an awesome light? Right? A bright light. Something about this cloud in which God dwells. It got so intense. Have you ever been in a situation where you're worshiping or where you're praying and you just get so overwhelmed with God's presence there at that moment that you almost can't stand it? <laughs> that it, it just knocks you down in a sense. I had, I had an experience like that when I was really young when I first became a Christian and me and a friend of mine were uh, at my house and we were praying and we'd been singing and we'd been doing this, some stuff just really trying to get really close to God and it got so intense that I literally had to open my eyes and shake it off because it was so overwhelming. It was almost scary, frightening. And I'll never forget that. I don't think I've ever experienced anything like that since then. But I can kind of see here what these priests were experiencing when the presence of God became so intense that they weren't even able to continue ministering. They had to stop. So, um, very cool, very interesting stuff. When we continue in chapter 8, which we'll pick up next week, Solomon says a prayer. Chapter 8 has 66 verses in it. It's a long chapter. Um, that's why I kind of wanted to maybe tap on the door of it tonight so that we could get through it next week. Um, but we're going to see how really truly intimate Solomon had become in his prayer life before God. I mean, this just wasn't a bless me club. This was a very deep relationship type of prayer that, that Solomon prays over Israel, in front of Israel, there at the temple, and... Uh, standing in front of the Ark of the Covenant. So we'll continue this next week, and hopefully I'll be able to bring you a little more insight on some of this stuff as far as the prayer and the history of these people. So it's very interesting. So let's go ahead and pray. Father, there is so much to learn. Sometimes it seems like it can be a little overwhelming. And uh, we do know that each and every little piece of furniture and design and decoration and all of that stuff, it all has unique and special meaning to it. But Lord, the most important thing is that we understand that you were, you were building a model on earth of what your throne room would look like in heaven. And, and it will be a great thing to be there, to see this throne in heaven that, that this temple has been modeled after and its greatness and magnificence and, and holiness. Lord, we're, sometimes we're a little bit tired. We're a little bit weary of some of the things that are going on around our lives, in our lives, the things of the world, the troubles, the sin. We're able to relate so much to Lot when your word tells us that he was vexed because of the wickedness of the town that he lived in. And we know you told us in the last days, Lord, right before you come, to retrieve us from this place that it would be like it was in the days of Noah. 
And Father, we're seeing that great wickedness today. And I just want to pray for us before we leave. Lord, that you'd help us to keep our focus on you. To keep our focus on your promises. And to keep our focus on that living hope that we have because of you, Jesus. It's all because of you. Where would we be, Lord, without you? We would be so lost, confused, no purpose in our lives. Thank you, Lord, for calling us by name. Thank you, God, for saving us. We love you, Lord. As we leave this place tonight, help our minds to be stayed upon thee that we might not sin. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.